Take a look at these three functions. How would you describe them? No, I don't mean give me the equations for the functions. Sure, they are literally what the functions are, but they don't describe them. They just tell you what they are. If you want to describe them, you would want to say stuff about the shape. Here, in this one, it just goes down at some speed. In this one, it just stays at one value the entire time. This one goes down and then swings back up. What we want is a method to figure out how to describe functions. We need a method to assign a value at every point telling us what the function looks like at that point. If it's negative, that means it's going down. If it's zero, it means it's a hill or a valley. And if it's positive, that means it's going up. If you couldn't already tell, this is basically what slope means. This should work for any x that we plug in. How do you go about finding a slope at exactly one point? You only know how to figure out the slope between two points, also known as the average rate of change. Let's have the first point be at x1 and the second point be at x2 for some function f of x. Then the rise becomes f of x2 minus f of x1 and the run becomes x2 minus x1. The slope is rise over run. The trick for finding the slope at one point starts by redefining the run part of the slope. We can let x2 minus x1 be delta x or change in x. Solving for x2, we write everything else in terms of only x1 and delta x. Now, to bring these points together, we can simply just decrease delta x and make it approach 0. That's actually exactly what the definition of a derivative is. More generally, the delta x is written as h, and sometimes the derivative function, f prime of x, is written as dy over dx. When you plug in any x into the derivative function, it tells you the slope of the original function at that x. What it's saying is that the slope of the function at a point is just a slope between two points, one being the point itself, and the other being a point that gets infinitely close. If you're more used to the y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 interpretation of the slope, there's also this definition of a derivative. What it's saying is that at x equals a, the slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. As the second point, x f of x, gets closer and closer to the first point, which is set at a. This is just a rewording of the definition of the derivative, and is used for finding a slope at a point instead of a general function which tells you the slope for any x that you plug in. A nice application is using it in combination with the point-slope form of a line to draw tangent lines of a function. But to do that, you first need to understand where the point-slope form comes from. First, you start with a normal line, y equals x. Then, you add a slope, m. Changing this value allows you to change the slope of the line. Next, you, switch, you shift it by some value x0 in the x direction, which will be the x coordinate of the point you want to intercept. You do the same in the y direction by adding y0 to the equation. Now it goes through the point x0, y0 with the slope of m. Doing some rearranging and there you have it, the point-slope form of a line. Now, moving on to using derivatives in combination with the point-slope form, we begin with a point x0, f of x0 on some function f of x. Plugging in f of x0 for y0, and then the slope to the derivative at that point, which is f prime of x0, we get this equation. This is the equation for the line that is tangent to the curve at that point. In other words, it models the slope at that point. What's applicable about this is that if you zoom in really closely, the function sort of looks like the point-slope version of it. This is where you dive into Taylor approximations, or using the derivatives to estimate a function around a point, but that's for later on. We must now cover all the basic derivative rules and their proofs. It's essential to learn, or at least see, the proof to base your knowledge into more concrete foundations rather than just memorization. We start off with the sum rule. This is quite basic, however, we need to practice proving things with the definition of a derivative. We start off by plugging in f of x plus g of x into the definition of a derivative. It looks a little long, but it's pretty simple. Next, we simplify by removing the parentheses. The trick is to rearrange the terms such as the f terms are with the f terms and the g's are with the g. Now you split up the limit. 
it should be clear here that you can just sub in f prime of x and g prime of x. And there you have it, the sum rule for derivatives. Next up is the product rule. This proof is more important as the answer doesn't seem that very intuitive. The proof is a little longer and is a little bit more tedious. Like before, we first plug it into the definition. This time, we have to add and subtract a special term, f of x times g of x plus h. It seems like a bizarre term to add into here, as it just makes everything much more complicated. But it allows us to break down the limit into its derivatives. Adding and subtracting a term does not change a value, as it's equivalent to adding zero. The trick is to factor out g of x plus h from the first two terms, and f of x from the last two terms. Now we just break down the limit into two smaller limits. Once again, now you recognize that the definition of a derivative and that you can sub in f of prime of x and g prime of x. This is a derivation of the product rule. Before we do the quotient rule, we need to do the chain rule. The chain rule relates to differentiating a composition of functions, or a function inside of a function. If you have y is equal to f of g of x, the derivative of y is equal to how much f changes when you change g, and how much g changes when you change x. Basically, y is dependent on f, which is dependent on g, which is dependent on x. To figure out how much y changes when you change x, you first need to figure out how much g changes when you change x, and then how much f changes from that resulting change. I know that sounded like a bunch of jumble of words. If you do need to, you can rewind the video and listen to that again. When you multiply the fractions, the dgs cancel out and you end up just having the derivative. This is more like an intuitive proof instead of a rigorous one, since the rigorous one is a lot more harder to comprehend. In derivative notations with functions, it's written something like this. This is a change in of f in respect to g and this is a change of g in respect to x. That is the chain rule. Moving on to the quotient rule, we will need to use the chain rule. First, we need to be able to differentiate the reciprocal of a function. To begin, we rewrite it in terms of exponents so we can utilize the power rule, where the derivative of x to the n is n times x to the n minus 1. I didn't want to prove this because it takes some work to write up and code it, for now, just accept as a fact. If you really want to, you can search up the proof on your own. Using the chain rule, we get the following equation. Simplifying a bit, we get that we now get the derivative of 1 over g of x. Now we can use this for the quotient rule. First, we break it down into the product of two functions, f of x and 1 over g of x. Then we apply the product rule, using our result earlier for the derivative of 1 over g of x. Lastly, we make them have common denominators and we simplify. As you can see, the result is not intuitive at all. This is why proofs are quite important. Lastly, for our rules, we have the inverse rule. This proof is actually one of the easiest. We first define g of x to be the inverse of f of x, meaning that f of g of x is x by definition. We then differentiate both sides using the chain rule for the left side we get the following equation. Dividing both sides of f prime of g of x, we get an equation for the derivative of g of x, which we defined earlier as the inverse of f of x. That is the inverse rule for derivatives. On to our last topic, we have the trig functions. We will only cover sine and cosine, as for the other trig functions, you can use one of our derivative rules to figure it out. We will intuitively prove the derivative of sine, as proving it rigorously requires even more than just the definition of the derivative. Look at this graph of sine, and take any point along with its slope at that point. We will start at x equals 0 for this case. You can sort of estimate the slope here to be approximately 1. It looks a little off here because of the scaling, but my point stands if you look at a properly scaled graph. Here it's 0, and here it's negative 1, again it's 0, and back at 1. If you were to plot these derivative values on a separate graph, it would end up mapping to cosine. And this makes sense, since sine is a periodic function, 
repeating at every 2 pi, the derivative should also repeat at every 2 pi. Therefore, the derivative of sine is cosine. I leave it up to you to do the same for the cosine graph and show to yourself that it is the same case that the derivative of cosine is negative sine. Going a little further, the derivative of a negative sine is going to be negative cosine and the derivative of that is sine, ending up back where we started. This is a four step loop and the fourth derivative of any of these trig functions ends up being itself. This is a fact that will be la important later on. Alright, I don't really got an outro for this video because I'm kind of rushing it at this point. I hope you found this helpful and interesting. Uh, leave feedback and suggestions in the comments and I'll be posting soon for Unit 3.